Hello and welcome to Know Your Story, Live It Boldly. This is a six-week Stevenson School class that we're running during Lent this year, 2017. This is Audrey Scanlon. I'm your bishop, also the facilitator for this class as we work together. This is the sixth lesson of six lessons in this class. This one we're calling Outlining Our Next Chapters. Outlining Our Next Chapters. This is the sixth of six lessons. Just as a way of review, the first week we were together, we talked about story and all different um, ways that we understand story, the history of story, the shape of story, different types of story. In week two, we talked about the Bible, both as literature and story, how it came to be, how it was shaped, the different um, parts of the Bible, understanding the Bible as a library, for example. In week three, we went through the Christian meta-narrative, the big story, of salvation and how all the parts of the Bible connect together to make one sweep of salvation. In week four, we spent some time doing a deep dive into discipleship, into looking at the different themes and lessons that Jesus told, taught us and understanding how we are to carry those forward today as modern disciples as, of Jesus. In week five, we moved from discipleship to consider apostleship or being sent, sent out to participate in God's mission, what that looks like, especially today and in the changing landscape and culture of the church. And then today we'll be outlining our next chapters, which is a way of saying that we'll be intentional about thinking how we'd like to go forward with um, our own Christian walk, how it is that we'd like to take an intentional, um, make a plan, an intentional plan, a discipleship plan for, for going forward from today. The key learnings of the class, which I hope you have um, taken away with you, are these, that stories are a powerful medium for making meaning and making connection. That the Bible is the story of God and of humankind in relationship with each other and with God. I hope that you have learned that we are God's beloved and that we are promised salvation in Jesus Christ. That Jesus' teaching invites us to a deeper life with God living as disciples, and that we are compelled to share the love of God, taking out God's message as apostles, participating in God's mission. So those are really the five um, key statements I would, I would make for each of the five lessons that we've explored so far. And so today we're going to consider the story of our own lives, both in Christ and in community. And as we do that, we do that knowing that our past has informed who we are today and that for many of us, we've had an opportunity to make choices about our lives. Many of us spend time trying to discern the will of God for our lives and that work of discernment is so important as we stop and slow down and, and open our hearts and stop talking and, and listen, listen for God's word. And I think when we do that, what happens is that we're invited into a co-creative partnership with God as we determine how God would have us to live our lives and, and how we can use the gifts that God has given us to make choices. So our lives have different choice points and we get to do some choosing. The 
is one choice that some of us make. At some point, we are no longer required to go to school beyond a certain age, and so many of us make the choice to go to university or to enter the workforce. It's an important choice point. Some people delay that choice to continue their education. Other people know exactly what they want to do from the time they're tiny. And so they launch right into a, a career or a trade. So that's an important choice point. And some people uh, make that choice many, many times. In my adult life, I've been a restaurant chef for 10 years. I was a teacher working in the guidance department for many years and working with children with special needs. And then I have had another calling as a priest in God's church and now a bishop. So for many of us, there are several choice points in our lives about career. Some of us make the choice to travel and to move all over this beautiful created world that God's given us and to study and explore different civilizations. And then there's some of us who stay at home. That's another choice. I know in, in my case, we spent 30 years almost in the same house, raising our family in the same town. And that gave us a, a really wonderful, focused and rich experience of, of how, how we lived in our family. Another choice point for many of us is whether or not we choose to get married or to have a life partner, or for some of us, we choose to stay on our own. And all of us get to choose what kind of community we want to be a part of, whether or not we want to be part of a large community with many friends, whether we're going to build a family, whether we're going to interact with the family of origin that we have. Uh, the sense of community is a choice that we get to make. And then for Christians, and disciples and apostles of Jesus, we get to choose exactly how much we have the cross and the Christian way influence the lives that we lead every single day. And so that's really what this lesson is, is about today, is taking a look at where we are right now in our lives in Christ, doing a little bit of uh, stopping and looking and listening and discerning where God has brought us to today, and then to be intentional and plan how we would like to go forward, what kind of choices we'd like to make in the future as disciples. And so for this lesson, for a short time, we're going to be returning to story and returning to scripture to identify where it is that we are right now in our lives, in our Christian lives. So if you could choose one story from scripture to serve as an icon of your life right now, where or what would it be? If you could choose one story from scripture, I'm going to give us some examples to think about. So it might be that you find right now that you are in a life position where you are facing some choices. And I've highlighted three stories from scripture here that you can reflect on. And following this lecture, what I hope you'll be able to do is go back and take a look at these slides again and spend some time in, in good discernment about um, all of the material that's presented here today. So you can really get a, a better sense. This is just a quick run through.
but you may be facing choices. And here are three, three pictures. The upper left-hand corner, we have Jesus calling James and John to come be his disciples. He says, follow me. We think probably behind him are Peter and Andrew. They were the first that were called. And there are James and John in their boat with their father, and they have to make the choice. Will they follow Jesus, leave their father in the boat, or will they stay? In the upper right-hand corner from the Hebrew Scriptures, we have Abram and Sari as they head out following God's, um, God's invitation to go to a place where God would show them. God promises that he will make Abram the father of many nations and enters into covenant relationship with Abram who then later becomes Abraham, and Sari, who later becomes Sarah. And at the very beginning, they have a choice to make. And then in the center and the bottom, we have Martha and Mary as they are with Jesus. And these two sisters are often set up as um, showing us the contemplative and the active lifestyles, Martha being the active one who's cooking and preparing a meal for Jesus, and Mary who sits at Jesus' feet, listening to his words. But they each had a choice to make about how they would respond when Jesus came to call. So it may be that you are facing choices in your life right now. It may be that you are suffering loss. Here are three slides that depict loss as we know it in the Bible. In the left-hand corner, we have Jesus again with Martha and Mary. And this time they are at the point where Lazarus, their brother, who's the second from the right there, wrapped up in bands of cloth, Lazarus has died and has been risen by Jesus. But before that moment, Martha and Mary were bereft and distraught, having suffered the loss of their brother. The upper right-hand corner is the story of Job, and this is the depiction. As one artist has imagined Job stripped of in the very opening chapter of the book, stripped of his family, stripped of his, his fortune, stripped of his health. And this is how one artist has depicted Job, who has lost everything. And then in the center picture, we have Moses on Mount Nebo as he sits and gazes over at the promised land. God has told him he is not to come along that it's going to be Joshua's job to bring the people across the river, uh, across the River Jordan into the Promised Land, and Moses doesn't get to go. So you've got to imagine that must have been no small amount of heartbreak for Moses and a, a certain loss. So it may be that right now in your life, you are in a place of having suffered some loss. You're in a place of grief right now. It could be that you're in a time of waiting. And here I've chosen four stories from Scripture to highlight. The upper left-hand corner is Noah in the boat. Look at how he sent the bird out. You can see the dove coming back with the branch to show that the flood water has subsided. But Noah spent more than a few days in that boat waiting, waiting for the bird, waiting for God to bring them to safety and to open the next chapter of, of um, human and animal life. The top picture in the center is the prodigal son and his father. The prodigal is returned. This is a Rembrandt painting. A section of that Rembrandt painting of the prodigal coming home. And you have to think that the father 
the way that the story tells us, um, the prodigal comes home and the father sees him from a distance and runs across the field to greet him, which indicates to me that the father's been waiting and watching for his son for some time. Below that, there's a picture of Hannah, Hannah who waited and waited and pleaded with God to, to give her a child. And she tells God that if she's lucky enough to have a child, that she will dedicate the child to the temple and to God. And so there she is with Samuel, presenting Samuel to the priest Eli in the temple. And then on the far right, we have Simeon, the old man in the temple who's there when Mary and Joseph bring Jesus, you know, what we now call the Feast of the Presentation, when Jesus is brought to the temple. And Simeon had been waiting and waiting and waiting for the consolation of Israel for the Messiah. We know the Nunc Dimittis, or the Song of Simeon, when he proclaims when Jesus is put in his arms and he sees, mine eyes have seen the Savior. So it may be that you, at this point in your life, are in a time of waiting. Perhaps you're just working hard. So many of us, when we begin our careers, or those of us in midlife, we're working hard. That may be your now. And so here's Paul writing an epistle. Paul, Paul was tireless. For the women of the Bible, these women are going to anoint Jesus at the tomb. For the women are central figures in the Bible for all of the work they did, sustaining family and home and hearth. And then in the upper right-hand corner, we have Solomon um, setting his workers to build the temple. So maybe that your now right now is that you're working very hard. Could be that you're looking for a new challenge. Again, on the left-hand side, we have another, another artist rendering of Paul. Paul, who was always looking to bring the good news of Jesus to communities, to new communities. So there he is. And on the right, we have Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip was open to the idea of God sending him where God needed him to be in order to bring the word of the gospel. And so here he is opening the scriptures to the Ethiopian eunuch and interpreting them for him. You can see that little band of water behind the eunuch. That's where he's going to be baptized. So it may be that you are feeling somewhat restless and looking for a new challenge. could be that you are finding family at the center of your life right now and that that is your now with Joseph and his brothers in the upper left hand corner. In the center picture we have Abram and Lot. I think that's an angel, the back of an angel in the foreground of the picture. You remember that when Abram and Sari set out, they brought their nephew Lot with them. Then in the right we have Ruth and Naomi. Ruth who followed her mother-in-law Naomi in an in a act of devotion and loyalty. So it may be that right now you are finding family at the center of your life and your now. That that may be where you are exercising your discipleship. Could be that you are feeling alone, that, that you may have suffered a loss which has resulted in a sense of loneliness or that you may have chosen 
to be alone. The stories that I've picked for a sense of loneliness include Jonah in the far left-hand corner. Jonah was called by God to go and and um, share God's word as a prophet, and he ran away. Instead of going to Nineveh, he hopped on a boat, and he was tossed overboard and swallowed by the big fish. And here you can see the big fish is spewing him out onto the beach, but he was in the belly of that fish for three days. Three days that Jonah was on his own, feeling alone. The next picture to the right, we have the story of Jesus and the widow at Nain. You can see behind the widow who's kneeling in front of Jesus, there's a young man sitting up, and that is the widow's son who's just been raised by Jesus. So imagine before this moment how alone the widow must have felt having lost her husband and then her son. The upper right-hand corner, we have the story of Jesus with the Syrophoenician woman who begs for Jesus' attention. He denies her, and she says, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs from under the table. So imagine in that moment of Initial rejection, how lost and alone she must have felt, knowing that Jesus could help her, but her choosing at first not to. And that, of course, propels her into a bit of an argument with Jesus, and she compels him to help her. And then in the bottom, we have a picture of Jeremiah, the prophet, who God ordained that Jeremiah would live a solitary life, a difficult life, carrying the word of God, but without the benefit of family or community to support him. So maybe that right now you are feeling a little alone in your life. It may be that you are feeling incredibly blessed. The story in the upper left-hand corner is the hemorrhaging woman. You can see her reaching out to touch the hem of Jesus' garment because she, she believes that she will be healed if she can but just touch a tiny corner of Jesus' garment. And she is. She is greatly blessed by the healing power of Jesus. The center picture, the picture of the promised land. Imagine after the exodus. Imagine after the wilderness wanderings following Moses. Imagine stepping into the promised land. What a feeling of blessing that must have been. And then on the upper right-hand corner, of course, is Caravaggio's depiction of the supper at Emmaus. The two travelers have been on the road with Jesus, and they've been heartbroken, telling him about the things that have happened. And finally, when they pray and they break bread, they realize that they are with Jesus, and they are fully, fully blessed. So those are some examples of maybe how you're feeling, or maybe we didn't capture what your now is. So spend a little bit of time, if not right now, then come back later and, and explore what is your now as a disciple. What story might you pull from scripture to connect your life to the life of God as we know it through Holy Scripture? And when you do, honor where you are right now. Pray it. By that, either offer a prayer of thanksgiving for your life 
or a prayer of intercession for those in your life, or a prayer of discernment for understanding where you are in your life, and, and look for God. Look for God in your life. Where is God now, right now, in your life? And then, for the rest of this lesson, we're going to look forward. We're going to look forward. Ready to write our next chapters. And something that I call a personal discipleship plan personal discipleship plan. And the reason I call it a personal plan is that there's only one right way for you to be a disciple of Jesus right now in your life. That everything that you've lived to this point has brought you to where you are right now. All of that is valuable, valuable material and experience. And you get to choose how you would like to step out next deepening your life in Christ and deepening the work of the mission of God. So this is a very personal exercise. And I think there are some key ingredients of any good plan, whether we're talking about discipleship or um, planning something at work, a strategic plan, there are some, just some key ingredients and I think the first is an articulated vision. So we want to know, as we think about where we want to end up, um, or, or what kind of plan we're going to make, we want to know where we're going to end up. What does it look like when we get there? We want to have clear steps for how we think we will get to the place we want to be. We want to set some benchmarks along the way so we don't feel like we're just wandering all the way. We do want to build in some accountability for those of us who need some structure and some incentive for moving forward. And at the end, of course, there's a sense of celebration in any planning and um, living out a plan. But once we've gotten there, we want to rejoice. So here are the steps that I'm going to suggest for creating a personal discipleship plan. And let me say that the plan that you may create as a result of this lesson might last for six months, it might last for six weeks or six days, it may have four or five or six different parts to it, or it may have one. Whatever you come up with. Again, this is personal. Whatever you come up with is going to be the best for you. So I'm going to lead us through six steps. The first is prayer. The second is discernment. The third is having an honest assessment of both the beginning and the end. So we've done some work already talking about the now. But where do you want to end up? Four, what are the steps? We'll talk about outlining steps to get to where we want to be, talk about the stops for assessing along the way, those benchmarks. We talk about how, for some of us, partnering for success, building an accountability is important. And then we'll talk about celebrating at the end. And, and that's, you know, every ending is really a new beginning. So when we get to the end of something, we think, well, what's next? You can see down in the bottom, I'm going to suggest that if you haven't got a journal yet, even just a spiral-bound notebook to keep track of your ideas for this, that uh, now is a good time to do that. So one of the prayers that I love and pray every day is is this prayer. It's the prayer of self-dedication. It's in our prayer book. 
Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated unto you, and then use us, we pray you, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I know that we've shared that prayer before together because it's one of my favorite prayers, but I'd invite you as the very first step in this process to pray this or some other prayer of discernment every day, every day. And then after you've prayed it, to sit in contemplation for some moments. You open your hearts and, and your minds your ears and your eyes to how God might be responding to you. This is so important. So, at the very beginning, what I'd, what I'd like you to do is to pray at least a week of this in the morning or in the evening as your day draws to a close and to spend some time in quiet and to make some notes about what you hear and how God speaks to you about how it is that your heart is being drawn, your mind is being guided, your imagination is being filled, your will is being controlled. And I'd keep a record of, of your response to this prayer or another prayer of discernment for at least a week. So there's sort of a, a um, leading into this process of at least a week or so of just good deep, steeped prayer. After you've, you've spent that time listening and praying, I would review your journal notes and see if there are some themes or directions. Are there some surprises in what you've heard? You disappointed? Did you have one idea about maybe what God was calling you to do and that didn't come to you? Has God been nudging you in another direction? Is there any repetition in the things that you've been hearing in the last week? And on a clean piece of paper in your journal, I would write the direction or the directions to, what, to which you are being called for discipleship. So maybe one idea that God has given to you in this last week, it may be three ideas, it may be six ideas. And I would suggest uh, the first time around that smaller may be better. It's not typically a, an American concept, but the smaller an idea you have may be the better way to begin this process of creating a personal discipleship plan. So it's okay to start small. The third step is to make an honest assessment of where you are right now and where you think you're going to end up. So is this a plan for right now? Is it a plan as you think about where you are right now? Is this idea that God's calling you to, does it make sense to you? And is it feasible? You're in the middle of raising a small family and God decides that you should go back to graduate school, maybe that's not feasible. My story is that the first time that I went to meet with my bishop and had discerned a call to the diaconate, um, he discerned differently for me. And I told him it just wasn't feasible with a child and children in first grade fourth grade and fifth grade for me to go to divinity school. So he sent me home for a year, and in that year's time, I figured out how it could be feasible. So as you think about maybe where God's calling you for your next step in discipleship, is it feasible? And then you can do a little what we call a SWOT analysis the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the idea. 
Again, checking back with where you are now and where is this going to bring you at the end. And then this next one is really important. This goes back to our lesson um, that we talked about discipleship. How does what you are hearing accord with your Christian values and a vision of yourself as a disciple of Jesus? This is probably the most important question as you come around to form this plan. So go back to those teachings that we discovered the themes of the teachings that Jesus brought to us about peace and justice and love and steadfastness and all of those different lessons that we learned as disciples of Jesus through Holy Scripture. As you consider where you think God is calling you for, to make this personal discipleship plan, how does it accord with some of those Christian values? And a vision of yourself. So that's a very, very important place to stop and do some assessment and discernment. And then you want to figure out what are the steps to get there. Now for people who are logical and, and linear and sequential thinkers, this is pretty easy and you probably do it naturally, but other people who are not created, who are creative and not necessarily linear thinkers, this is important. So for each idea that you have discerned, and it may be one, it may be three, it may be six or eight, write the steps you need to get to the desired end. This sounds tedious and it probably is, but I think it's important. So note the time frames, the materials you're gonna need, the visual image of what it will look like at the end. You can write in broad sweeps. We're going to come back to identifying benchmarks. So let me give you an example of this, of an example of, of a discipleship decision I made this fall. And that was that my niece and nephew, my sister's daughter and my brother's son, were both the first children in their families to go away to college this year. And I remembered what it was like for me to go away from home for the first time. And I remembered, this is before the days of cell phones and even computers, I remember my mother wrote me a letter almost every day. You can believe it. Well, I wasn't keen on writing a letter every day to my niece and nephew, but I decided that I wanted them, the desired end state was for them to feel a sense of family connection and support while they went away for the first time. So I decided to write letters. What I did, here are the steps. I found out what their calendars were for the semester and how, you know, I could get a letter to them. I set up a regular routine for writing a letter to them. At first I started typing letters on my computer, one to each of them. And after about a month or so, I decided I was writing a lot of the same stuff. So I started writing a Dear Helen and Hunter letter where they both got the same letter, which was also a way of sort of connecting them to each other. So every Monday now, since the beginning of the year, the beginning of the school year, I have taken about half an hour of my time to write one letter that I sent to both of them. So I started this weekly effort and I took a little break at Thanksgiving and I took a little break while they were at Christmas holiday. But I've done it every week. And so what did I need for materials? Well, pens and papers and my computer and my printer and some stamps. And when did I start? I started right after Labor Day. So that's a small way, an example of a little idea that I had sense of discipleship in which I wanted to express love and community and connection with my niece and nephew and the steps that I discerned I needed to do in order to, to follow through. So that's a pretty simple example. Some of you may have bigger bigger ideas. 
And if you do, you may need to stop for assessment along the way. So set some specific times when you're going to stop and think about what you're doing. Is it too much, too little? Is it making a difference? How would you like to tweak it? There was that point where I stopped writing two separate letters and decided that I was going to write one letter to two people and, and uh, that was the tweak that I made. Could the experience be deepened? And what are the outcomes that you had imagined? Are you meeting those? Do you need to do more? Do you need to do less in order to create the desired end from the very first thought? The sixth step is what I call partnering for success. So it's not terribly hard for me to sit down every Monday and spend a little bit of time writing a letter. Um, and I've been quite, it's been quite easy for me to do that, but other plans are more complex and you may want an accountability partner. Is there somebody else that you want to involve in your plan to make sure it's actually going to happen? There was a time in my life when I wanted to go to the gym every day and I just knew that if it was up to me to get up every morning, it might not happen with great regularity. And so um, one of my neighbors also had the same desired end of getting to the gym every morning. And so we started picking each other up. And when you are lying in a warm bed and you know that there's somebody who's going to expect you to be giving them a ride in 20 minutes or a half an hour, boy, does that get you out of bed. So you might need to partner for success with your discipleship plan. And remember, you know, that's not foreign to the Christian idea. Jesus sent out the disciples two by two. He didn't send folks out by themselves. So see if you need to find a partner to have a successful experience. And then at the end, again, every, every end is a new beginning, so be sure to celebrate and refocus. Take a look at what's happened. What changes have taken place? Has the desired end been met? What would you, if anything, like to do differently from, from that point on? Is it time to move on? Maybe you've accomplished everything you needed to accomplish, and it's time to come up with a new refocused goal. And how might you celebrate not just the fact that you've done a good job, because discipleship is not about checking off achievements, but recognizing the abundance of blessings that you have received in this journey of discipleship. We think often about service as, as being something that we do for others. But remember, again, as we talked about um, God's mission in the last lesson, in our participation in mission, that, that it's really about forming relationship. So what are the blessings that you've received? Not just that you've given, but that you have received. And then think about where you and Jesus might walk together next. This is another depiction of the uh, road to Emmaus. You can see Jesus with the two men on the road, and you can see in the foreground of that picture, I love it, the lilies, which signify Easter, of course, and resurrection. So as you're forming your discipleship plan and as you're working through it, you, you ask yourself as you achieve these small, small steps, recognize the abundance of blessings that you've received, and then think, well, what are you going to do next? At the end of the first lesson, we talked about the whole point of connecting God's story to our story. And the three steps identifying our now, finding God's story, and, and how we connect our now to the story in, in Scripture, 
And then the question is not to let it rest there, but to always ask, what will God and I make of this next? And so that's one way to think about how we explore scripture as disciples. But it's even more than that. It's about living our lives as disciples, not just connecting with scripture and understanding where we are in scripture, but understanding where God's calling us to use that connection for a deeper life in Christ. That is, I believe, called knowing our stories and living them boldly. That's what we're doing. And so as we come to a close, this is a review of the material for this week, the warm-up prompt, which you may have done already. Tell a story about when you created something. I'm inviting you today to create a draft of a personal discipleship plan. There are three ATLA articles in the ATLA database, which I think are helpful as we think about um, planning our lives as disciples of Jesus. The writing exercise says, using the material in the lecture as a springboard, create that plan. You don't need to turn that in in its entirety. But for the writing assignment, share sort of the um, hope for outcome of one of those steps and the action steps that you've discerned. So you don't need to submit an entire discipleship plan, but just a, a sense of the beginning and the end and maybe some of the steps in the middle. And then for the discussion online, how will you structure the shaping of, and how will your plan be supported? How does this kind of plan, personal discipleship plan, shift you from understanding yourself as a disciple to doing the work of the apostle? And then when you think on a broader basis, how does your congregation participate as, as a, a body of disciples. Does your congregation have a plan? How is it implemented and shared? And so as we close, here is a prayer of gratitude, not just for our time today, but for the time that we've shared in the last six lessons together. Gracious God, we thank you for this community and for the ways that we have discerned you in our midst, leading and guiding us to new discoveries, insights, and fresh challenges to grow in you. Continue to breathe the power of your Holy Spirit into us that we may be disciples of Jesus, apostles bearing the good news, and further your mission in this world. Amen.